Welcome everybody to your online service today. I'm Simon. I'm the pastor of Lauren Baptist Church. Over the last few weeks, we've been meeting like this. We've been meeting online due to the high levels of COVID-19 uh, within our community. Uh, we're going to continue meeting online uh, for the next few weeks for the sake of the safety of those within our church uh, and in our town. We love meeting together in the presence of God and, and we can't replicate that uh, online, but we believe this is the right thing to do. We're so glad that there's been no transmission of the virus stemming from our physical gatherings throughout 2020. Uh, and we owe that to the, the grace of God uh, and to the congregation who've gone over and above, going to great lengths to make our church a safe environment. But this past week, the executive has invited churches uh, to meet online. Uh, that these are very difficult days for everyone in society, uh, not least for those in government. Uh, and so I want to begin this morning by asking you to pray for them, uh, to remember them as you come before God day after day. Well, as we begin our worship, Psalm 105 says, Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Our Father, we are creatures of the dust, and you are the omnipotent creator, and yet you care for us. Fill us with joy and supply us with strength, and help us as we seek you today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. point in our service I want to bring before you a few notices for the week ahead. Uh, tomorrow night uh, Baptist women are beginning their new online course. We'll hear more about that in a little moment. On Tuesday then uh, you'll receive an email uh, with prayer points for the church uh, along with Pastor John's study notes. Please take time to read uh, and to pray. Do remember in your prayers especially the family of William Potts his funeral is going to be on Tuesday afternoon. And then on Wednesday at 8 o'clock, we're going to meet together on Zoom. Colin Cooper uh, will be joining us online again as he carries on our course in evangelism. Uh, don't worry if you weren't there the other two nights when Colin was speaking uh, in November and December. Uh, you're very welcome uh, still to join us and you'll still find that very, very helpful. 
Next Sunday then I will meet uh, via the YouTube channel once more and that video will be available from 11 o'clock in the morning. Well you might be wondering about that first announcement, the online women's course. Uh, you, may have a, you may have missed that announcement during the week um, but I asked, asked mum uh, to explain what it is and how to sign up uh, so that you can take part uh, via Zoom. So she sent me through uh, this message that we're going to watch together. Hello, my name is Gail Curry and I just want to tell you about a course that Baptist Women are starting on Monday the 11th of January at 8pm. It's an online course and it was great to see so many women from Larn Baptist joining with us in our last Bible study. Uh, this is a course in contentment and we will be watching a 20 minute video each week by Melissa Kruger and then we we'll break up into discussion groups. Um, Paul in the New Testament says that he has learned to be content whether he has plenty or whether he is in need. How can we learn that secret of contentment no matter what our circumstances are? Well, we're going to get together, we're going to study God's word, we're going to look at true biblical contentment and we'll have opportunity to talk about it and to apply it into our own lives as we chat with women all over Ireland. You can apply for this course at Irish Baptist Women dot org. Um, I hope and maybe see you on Monday night. Well, I know many were encouraged by the last online course that was done during the autumn term and, and I trust you'll be encouraged by this new one starting tomorrow. Before we sing again, we're going to go to David and Jude's house. David's going to lead us in prayer and bring us our Bible reading, which is in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Thank you, David. Hello to everyone from the Murphy household here. Our, our reading this morning is taken from the book of Acts chapter 6 and verses 1 to 7. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicon, and Timon, and Parmas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us day by day. We want to thank you that you supply our need day by day. And we want to thank you that we're able to come to you through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, at this time, we realise that we're going through this pandemic we realise that it's been going on for a lot longer than that we thought that would happen. But we want to thank you that you've been there for us. We want to thank you that, you're, that you've helped us, that you've strengthened us, that you've guided us and that you've protected us too. And Father, at this time we want to bring before you all those that, who have been working in the hospitals and the care homes. Lord, we realise the stress that they've been under, the strain, the pressure the difficulty. Father, and we just pray that you will continue to go before them. We pray that you continue to guide them and to lead them. And the Lord, just give them the help that they need and the strength. Because it is fierce pressure. They're tired. And the Lord, we just ask that you will come and be with them. 
We pray for the police service of Northern Ireland, the Lord, at this time, and we realise the responsibility that they have. Lord, we just ask that you go before them, because, Lord, they will face difficulties with people that they speak to, and we just ask that you just help them to remain calm in the situations that they face. And, Father, we thank you for politicians. We realise what they're going through, too, Father, and the challenges that they face day by day. And the Lord, we just ask that they would seek your face, that they would look to you, and that they would ask for your wisdom and guidance, Lord. And Father, we just pray for Simon this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would bless him and that you would strengthen him. But the Lord, we pray most importantly that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that the words that he brings forth, Lord, will be used to touch people's hearts, to challenge people's hearts, and to realise the need of a saviour. A saviour who is able to save them from their sin, but also to protect them and to lead them and to guide them through life and give them that assurance that they need. So Lord, we just bring these things before you and we thank you again, Lord, for your, your help and your love. Love that is never ending and love that will continue to be there for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
to all the boys and girls who are watching this morning. I want to speak to you for a moment. I want to say two things. Two things. Here's the first. To those who were working for the AQEs, uh, I just want to say how sorry I am to watch the news and hear about the change in all the dates and that there will only be one exam in February. Uh, I know that means you'll have even longer to do practice papers and I really feel for you. Just, I just want you to know that we're praying for you. And for all the boys and girls, uh, you're going to be working at home, doing your, your schoolwork with your parents over the next few weeks. I'm uh, praying for you as well. I know you're going to have lots of questions being asked. You're going to have lots of questions to work through and answer. But let me ask another question this morning. Another question. Have you ever thought about elders and deacons in our church? What are elders? What are deacons? We, we talk all the time about elders in our church. We have Andrew. And we have Scott. And I'm an elder as well. We've got three elders. And uh, we also talk about deacons. We have Brian and we have Leslie and we have Roy and we have Tim. So we talk about elders and we talk about deacons, but why? What do they do? Why are they there? Well, that's a good question to ask. Here's, here's the answer. Simon's asked for a one minute video on what elders do in Lauren Baptist Church. You might think we just go to church meetings and have once a month meetings with the deacons, but it's more than that. The first thing is we love the Lord and seek to live in a way that pleases him like many of our members. Number two, we love God's word and we seek to make sure that it's taught properly. Number three, we love God's people. We love the church and the members of the church. We pray for the church, we care for the members, we seek to help the members, we want to make sure the church is safe and secure, that everyone is well fed with good teaching and good fellowship. We also have to be watchful for anything that might harm the church or the church members, sometimes having to correct, rarely having to rebuke. And elders in being caring should always be eager and willing as we serve as examples. That's what elders do in Lauren Baptist Church. Deacon's roles include practical elements such as maintaining the building, distributing information, uh, ensuring rotas are in place and so on. For example, as church secretary, my role is to make sure that the church is informed of any upcoming events, to record and distribute minutes for various meetings and pass on correspondence to the relevant people. Uh, this includes the constant bombardment of Zoom links you've been receiving for the past 10 months. Um, in other words, uh, I've become the spiritual equivalent of junk mail. On the other hand, deacons aren't just administrators or building contractors overseeing the day-to-day -day running of the church. We're also responsible for making people feel welcome, for establishing mercy ministries to meet people's needs, and offering prayerful support to the elders. In Acts 6, we read of seven men who were set apart to ensure that all the widows within the church in Jerusalem received enough food. This freed up the apostles to fulfill their primary responsibilities, prayer and the ministry of the word. That's the role of the deacon. So hopefully this brief summary gives you a better idea of what a deacon does. So that is what an elder does, and that is what a deacon does. Why do we have them? Here's the answer. For you. For you. God has told us to have elders and to have deacons, and he's given them to us. And they're there for you. So that with all that goes on in the church, and there's so much that happens, so much more than you realise, so much happens in the church. With all of that taking place, the elders and the deacons are there to make sure that you hear about Jesus Christ. They take care of everything in the background, so there's nothing there to distract you from the message of Jesus. You remember that message, don't you? If you've come to our church, you've heard it. You've heard about a God who loves you, a God who's promised to always be with you if you trust in him. He's the one who gave you his son. You remember that? You remember how he gave his son? He gave him to die 
to die on the cross. And that was for everyone who would believe in him. You've heard that as well. And you know that if you believe in Jesus, if you believe that he died for you, you'll be forgiven of your sin and you'll be made part of the family of God. That's amazing. This is an amazing message. And that's why we have elders and deacons. To make sure that you don't get distracted by the other things going on in church, but that you hear that message and you know exactly what it is God has called you to do. To believe in Jesus. Because he forgives everybody who trusts in him. That's why we have elders in Lauren Baptist Church. That's why Andrew, Scott and myself are there. And that's why we have deacons, Brian, Leslie, Roy and Tim, for you. God has given them for you. And if you listen carefully to the sermon this morning, you'll hear a little bit more about how that's true. We're going to sing and then we're going to turn to that passage that David read for us in Acts chapter 6. I die and shall be to 
How can I ruin the church? Have you ever asked that question? How can I ruin the church? If you have, here are five simple steps, five ways to ruin a church. Number one, spend time thinking about how long you've been a member, how much time you've contributed to the church and how underappreciated and undervalued you are. Take note of the things that are wrong with the church. Take note of the, the names of the people that you think shouldn't be in the positions they're in, uh, the people that bother you within the church. That's step one. Okay, now you're ready for step two. Get someone else on board. So you got to pick up the phone. Uh, if we weren't in lockdown, you could meet up with somebody for a coffee. But get them on, on the phone, somebody else from the church, uh, and tell them about how the church is changing and how so many things are wrong. And ask that friend if they know of anybody else who has concerns. Step two. Step three. It's time to widen the net. So you need a group. Get a group together. Um, tell them all that there's an undercurrent of grievance within the church. A lot of hurt. Problems have been left unaddressed for too long. And gather up their complaints as they speak back to you as well. That's step three. Step number four. Okay, now you're ready to grow that group. You're in a position now where you can persuade even the happy members of the church to come on board. Because people love to side with the underdog. They love to stand with the person who's right and standing up against moral failure within the church for the sake of fairness. So all you have to do is choose your words carefully. and Make sure you display great spiritual knowledge an understanding of the church constitution and show that you're going to do everything by the letter of the law and, and get more people on side. Step five, once you have won people over and you've got a sufficient group behind you, then, then go to the church leadership and, and show them that list of complaints. Tell them how much they have failed uh, and that there's lots of wounds that have to be healed and here's the ultimatum, here's what they have to do, or they can get out. Now once you reach that point, it doesn't really matter what happens from there, you'll have succeeded. You'll have ruined the church, because you'll have taken the tension away from gospel advancement to your own personal grievance and grumbling. Your church might recover, might recover in a few years, that's okay. All you have to do is just follow the same simple five steps and you'll be able to ruin it all over again. Five steps to ruin your church. But I don't, I don't think there's going to be anybody watching this morning wondering to themselves, how can I ruin my church? It's not really how we think. But I do know that we're not perfect people. And I know that grievances uh, can surface. They can occur. And if we allow them to have a place in our hearts, that grievance can be nurtured. It can grow until we allow it to ruin our church. And we find that we've jumped through these five steps without even realizing it. And this is not unique to churches today. We're in Acts chapter 6 and the early church faced a similar danger. But in the verses that we read, we learn how the church dealt with that situation in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want you to notice, first of all, this morning, the problem, the problem that arose. There's great growth in this church in Jerusalem. People were coming to faith and people were pouring into the assembly of believers. And God was adding disciples daily. But with that increase in growth came increasing conflict. The church wasn't perfect. No church is. And the Bible is very clear and honest about that. In every church there are problems. What was the problem? Well, first of all, it was a problem of administration. Problem of an administration. Verse 1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. There are two groups mentioned here, the Hellenists and the Hebrews. The Hebrews were Jews from Jerusalem <clears throat> or the surrounding area of Judea. They had lived there a long time, probably born there. The Hellenists, they were Jews from other parts of the world, the Greek-speaking world. That's where the, the word Hellenist comes from. 
uh, and there's a breakdown of some kind. The Hellenists are now complaining that the widows from their group, from their background, that they're being overlooked. Now this was hugely important. This wasn't a trivial matter. The scripture reinforced this again and again with verses like Psalm 68 verse 5 that states that God is the father of the fatherless, protector of the widows. The scripture is clear that he loves widows. He cares for them. And the church knew it was important for them to care for widows too. But the problem was that here in this church, there are people from different cultures, different backgrounds, who spoke different languages. And for some reason, the Hellenist widows, they aren't getting the same help that the Hebrew widows are getting. So the, the food that's going out was going uh, to one group and not the other, or more was going to one group and less to the other. We're not really sure. Now, there's no evidence that this was happening deliberately. I think it probably had more to do with the growth of the church. Thousands of people being converted, uh, worshipping in the church in Jerusalem. And when a group is growing like this, it's easy for someone to be overlooked. Especially a group like this, the widows. And especially if they don't speak the same language. Church growth can bring challenges. We, we can look back to a time when the church was small, it was an intimate community, but then new people came in with different backgrounds, sometimes different ideas. Uh, and we can look back and say it was easier when there were fewer. Church growth can lead to great problems that weren't there before. So it seems there was this problem of administration. And that was creating the problem of distraction. The problem of distraction. Look at verse 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. It seems some of the people wanted Peter, James, John, the other apostles, to look after the widows. You know, after all, they would have been impartial, they would have been fair, they were trained by Jesus, and um, they would have done a good job. Except that would have been a deadly attack, a great distraction. Waiting on tables would have given the apostles less time to do anything else. And they would have dried up under the weight of serving meals and counselling and preaching and praying and leading. Something would have to give way. They would have been distracted from their main duties, which were, they say, prayer and preaching. I think that's a big temptation for any church elders. You know, a problem arises in the church and we can think, well, it's my responsibility to step in and fix it. After all, Jesus, he washed the disciples' feet. We're servants at the end of the day. It's my job to do anything that comes my way. And we are servants. We'll think about that in a moment. But we're servants with a different role. And we can fall into the trap of thinking we have to sort out every situation and carry all the burdens of the church, trying to be the omnipresent hand of God to everyone, while neglecting our first priorities, which are preaching and prayer. So the problem was a, one of administration, a one of distraction, and one then of division, a problem of division. These widows in the Hellenistic group were being neglected and that issue led to complaints from one group of brothers against another. People are speaking against one another in the church. Instead of going to the leadership, instead of dealing with this in a godly way, they complain about others within the fellowship. And as you look at the language of verse 1, it's clear that sectarianism is beginning to creep into the church. It's becoming an us and them, us and them. There's the beginning of division, the beginning of infighting. And that's really the heart of the problem. When Christ died, he died to unite a people to himself from every tribe, tongue, language, nation. They'd be one people and new people. The Jew, the Greek, from all nations, he was making a, a new people. And as this complaining surfaces, it threatens 
to undermine the work of the cross itself. Jesus said in John 13, verses 34 to 35, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I love you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Complaining and grumbling in the church is like going down to the foundations of a building and laying explosives. Because when it blows up, you can bring the whole church down. That's, that's really the heart of the problem. And you realise then how serious an issue this was. It's, it's a little crack in the dam that leads to great destruction. And the issue of food distribution to a small section of the church, the tiniest event had the potential to cause the greatest problem. R. Kent Hughes, in his commentary on Acts, talks about a church in Dallas where they had a big fallout and split into factions and there was lawsuits from one group against another to lay claim to the church property. And when it went to the church court, uh, the newspapers were, <laughs> were just hungry to, to write about the story because at the heart of it, at the beginning of it, was an elder sitting at a meal, looking at the, the plate of a child sitting behind him, complaining about the slice of ham he had received. The child's slice of ham was bigger. And that's, that was the beginning of the issue. And it brought great dishonour, not just to that church, but to the name of Jesus Christ. This early church in Jerusalem is a thriving, growing church. But here is Satan at work to sow a spirit of complaint and grumbling and gossip among God's people, hoping to split the church into factions. This is one of his tactics, and we see this still today. How many churches have been destroyed in the same way? Souls are being saved. The church is reaching the community. Then someone complains and they're not appreciated or they're undervalued or there's some offence and bitterness sets in. And then all of a sudden it ignites and it spreads. That's the situation of Acts chapter 6. And that was the seriousness of the problem. The delicate unity of the church became threatened and the testimony of the gospel was endangered. The problem. What was the solution? That's our second point, the solution. I want to begin by noting what they didn't do. What they didn't do. The apostles didn't say, let's have two churches. Let's get a church for the Greek speakers and a church for the Hebrew speakers. Keep them apart and that will solve the problem. That would have undermined the gospel. So they don't do that. Secondly, they don't complain harshly. Uh, they don't take it too personally and, and say, well, we've got to bring the hammer down on the Hellenists. Be quiet. Just follow us. They don't ignore them, refuse to talk to them and say, well, let's make them suffer. So they know what happens to troublemakers. They don't do that. And, and nor is there a church split. We don't find the Hellenists getting up and saying, well, let's go our way. Let's start our own church. Uh, come on and let's do things the way they should be done. Instead, what the apostles do is they provide us with five steps, five steps to strengthen your church. We thought about five steps to ruin your church. Here are five steps to strengthen her. Step number one, they gather the people. Look at verse two. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples. The church decides the course of action together. The apostles give the lead. So they're the ones taking the initiative here. They're leading. But it's the church that makes a decision. Now, what does that tell you about their sense of power? You know, these are the men who are laying the foundation of the church. The apostles. But they don't confuse that position with authority with control and that's important and, and, and when that confusion does take place it becomes very damaging and you end up with church members who are, who are afraid to tie their own shoelaces without getting permission from the pastor that's heavy handed shepherding and that's not right they gather the people that's the first step and then secondly they teach the priorities 
they teach the priorities. Verse 2, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. The primary task for the church is to communicate to the world the word of God. The Lord himself said, Go and make disciples of all nations. In Acts 1 verse 8, he said, You shall be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And there are many good things that elders can do, but this is what they must do. This is the reason for the existence of the church. And I don't think any church sets out to neglect the preaching of the word of God, but some churches end up doing it anyway. That's because not because of any great sin necessarily. Often it's because they simply become preoccupied with other things. And they don't even notice that preaching is being neglected and prayer is being neglected. And that's a tragedy. When there's no care for the spiritual condition of the church through the word, through prayer, a church will die. Verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That word ministry is the same Greek word used in verse 2, translated as serving, when they talk about serving the tables. They're not adverse to serving food. They're not adverse to being servants. But they're saying our serving, our call to serve, first and foremost, is to serve the word in prayer. This is a demanding task. That's what they're teaching the church. This is demanding. And we're determined as the church leaders. And you should be determined as a church. This is what they're saying. To have a, a, a vision for this is our priority. That the word of God and prayer have first place. That's their priority. And we need that vision to implement that same priority. The word of God declared in prayer. But that's not the whole picture. So here's the first step. They gather the people. They teach the priorities. It's the word of God and prayer. And they seek a balanced ministry. Third step. A balanced ministry. Verse 3. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. They don't say we need to preach the word. And don't have time, the same time to give to serving tables. So let's stop serving the tables. Let's ditch this all together. No. There's no doubt in their minds the widows need fed. There's no question in the mind of the apostles that this should not be sorted. That they should be cared for. But Luke is making it clear that the place of the word of God. And the expansion of the work of Christ must be first. The main thing has got to be the main thing in the church. But it has to be followed by a, a care for the whole person as the word of God is put into practice. This is a balanced ministry. This is a healthy church. We can't be a word-centered church and not care for one another. Because the word of God tells us to do exactly that. And if we're obedient, then we will have a balanced ministry. Then we will be seeking to make provisions to care for those who have need. There are some churches who go to, from one extreme to the other, don't they? they? They show little evidence of the word. And there are other churches who proclaim the word but show little evidence of open, loving care for one another. And, and you see, the two must marry. The two have got to come together. There has to be a balanced ministry. We're to cling to God's word and we're to love and pour out care for one another. So they, they seek a balanced ministry. And then fourthly, the fourth step, they share responsibility. They share responsibility. Sometimes church leaders think they have to sort out everything. Things will not happen the way they should if I don't do it. No one can do the job I can. Well, the apostles, they don't think like that. They resist that temptation and they refuse to set themselves up as little gods in the church. They delegate. Paul writes... Later in the New Testament about spiritual gifts. And he says the Holy Spirit gives gifts to each Christian. Every believer has at least one gift. No one person gets all the gifts. And yet a lot of churches are impoverished. Because one or two people act in that way. As if 
they've got to exercise all the gifts and, and those who have gifts in the church, their gifts go unused. And the church is poor for it. But they share responsibility. They share responsibility. And step five, they appoint deacons. They appoint deacons. In verse three, they say, Pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Here is the beginning of the diagonal. The church appoints a group to minister to the practical needs of the church. Uh, sometimes we forget this. Sometimes in our churches, the deacon is someone who we see as just looking after the building, making sure the, the taps work and the toilets flush, and that's essentially their job. Keady, in his commentary, says something very interesting. He says this, Many modern deacons are little more than committee men administering church finances and property, which serves to highlight how far the diagonate has fallen from the New Testament pattern. That's interesting. And he goes on to say, The apostles envisaged a powerful, personal mercy ministry. This was to be a roll-up-your-sleeves, hands-on ministry requiring an enthusiasm for helping people. That's at the heart of what a deacon does. He helps people. We are blessed to have four deacons in our church who help people in, in lots of different ways. And they need our prayer, they need our support, because they're communicating the gospel of Christ in that work. That's, that's why the apostles stress the need for spiritual qualifications. Verse 3, they say they need wisdom. We need people who understand people, and who understand how to do their tasks. And we need people, they say, who are full of the Spirit, full of the Spirit, spiritual people. In fact, the first two names in verse 5, Stephen and Philip indicate that. These are two men we'll read about and they're out there witnessing the people, sharing the gospel, bringing people to Christ. And I read that and I, I think, well, why? Why? Wouldn't they be better getting a, a good baker for this role? It has to do with food. Wouldn't, wouldn't they be better getting the, 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 the local Christian chef to come in and take control of this? Wouldn't they be better getting the man who knows about rotas to come in? Why, why do they need men filled with the Holy Spirit for a food program? Well, have you ever been served a meal by someone full of bitterness and resentment? Or someone full of their own self-importance? You kind of lose your appetite, don't you? It's certainly not a blessing. But when you're served by someone who's full of joy, full of the life of the Spirit, full of kindness, full of fruit, what a difference that makes. What an, what an honour it is to be treated in that way as you're served in that practical way. We're, we're very glad to have Brian, Leslie, Roy and Tim serving as deacons. They're, they're the reason so much of the activity of the church just happens. And so as a church, we need to commit to supporting them, to pray for them, and we need to decide um, that we will respond to their calls for volunteers and, and for helpers. We've got to recognize that th these are, are men filled with the Spirit. These are men worthy of our trust. Well, we should be willing to receive their, their guidance uh, and their, their input into our lives. After all, they are there for our joy, aren't they? And I hope that you are there for their joy. Uh, I just want to take this moment in the sermon to, to, to just express thank you uh, to them for the ministry, uh, for the gifts and the wisdom that they uh, have given to the church. Uh, and, and I want to say as well that we're thrilled that Jesus has placed you, each of you, among us uh, and equipped you for that role. You're vital for a healthy church, for the strengthening of a church. We need deacons who are filled with the Spirit and with wisdom. So here's a solution to gather the people, to teach their priorities, to seek a balanced ministry, to share the responsibility, and to appoint deacons. Well, there's an outcome to all this. There's an outcome. We thought about the problem, the solution, 
And lastly, as we come towards an end, the outcome. The church was growing, but with that growth came the threat uh, against uh, the unity of the church and a distraction from the priority of the church. This could have gotten well out of hand. The church could have been torn apart, as many churches have been, by such situations. But now, because of God's leading, this is what we read in verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. The gospel spread. The apostles were free to dedicate their time to prayer and preaching. And, and the growth increased. More people became genuine disciples and followed Christ. And even enemies of the cross were converted. We read about a great many of the priests who became obedient to the faith. Religious leaders who had once opposed Christ are now joining Christ. Isn't that what we long for? We want to ask God to bless us in this way. We want growth like this. Uh, and so we must, we must seek to strengthen the church uh, as we thought about this morning. But as we come to a close, maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, I don't follow Jesus and I haven't much, thought much about him before. Or maybe, maybe you're saying, well, I'm one of these priests. I'm an enemy of Jesus. I despise Jesus. In fact, maybe that's why you're watching this morning. Because of the title of the sermon that caught your interest. How to ruin a church. And you thought, I, I want to watch that. You hate us. And you're an enemy of the cross. Well, can I ask you to look at what's happening here in Acts chapter 6. And then look through the corridors of history. Down through to today. Look at the churches around you today. We're talking to you about Jesus, talking to you about the God of infinite love. And we're telling you that there's a real problem. And the problem is that you've turned your back on his love. In our sin, we have wronged God and we've rejected him as king. Show off God, I'm in charge, not you. That's what we've said. And he's offered himself to us, but we've rejected him. Creatures of the dirt. Daring to defy the creator God. And we deserve his holy wrath. And it will come. He's promised to judge those who have rebelled against him. But while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The son of God came into the world and he lived perfectly in our place. So that we could receive that perfect life. He lived for us. And he died for us. And the worst part of that death was not the physical pain, but the spiritual anguish. As, as he swallowed the wrath of God in his body, in his soul, taking our guilt, taking our shame, taking our death, that we might live. That's the good news that the apostles were preaching in Jerusalem through prayer. And that, that is the same message we hold out to you as Lauren Baptist Church. That you confess your sin to God. He already knows your sin. That you confess it. And more than that, that you embrace his promises. He says that all who call on his name will be saved. You will be adopted into his family. You will be forgiven. God says in this message, come and trust in my son Jesus Christ. And have a life following him, your master and your saviour. This church in Acts chapter 6 organised their lives so that the people of their city would go on hearing the message and be saved. As Lauren Baptist Church, that's what we're seeking to do under the leading of God, to organise ourselves, organise our lives, that you would hear this message, our neighbours, our community our families, and that you would be saved. That's the reason we exist. It's the reason we're online. You know, it's the reason we have deacons. So that you will hear the gospel, that you'll believe it, 
and that you'll be saved. And that's what we hold out to you together as Lauren Baptist Church. We hold out the, the gospel offer of a saviour who will forgive you freely and completely if you trust in Jesus. I wonder will you come and know his forgiveness. That's why we structured ourselves the way we have. That's why we have deacons for you, that you might hear the message of the gospel, that you might believe. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Oh, Father, for eyes to see the truth of your word, for minds to understand and for hearts to believe and receive and follow in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour and Master. Oh, we pray that you would work in all who have listened this morning. And we pray you would strengthen us as a church. And Lord, we pray that great glory would be brought to Jesus. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.